Hello, and welcome to the Working Tools Masonic Podcast, where today we will continue our discussion of the officer line. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our opinions and thoughts are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions, either here on YouTube or on our Facebook page. We'd also appreciate a thumbs up and especially any comments on our videos. Masonic Podcast. I'm Matt Apple. I'm a Mason here in, in the Grand Lodge of Washington. And today I have with me our, our two usual uh, co-host uh, slash suspects, uh, Stephen Chung from the Grand Lodge of BC in the Yukon and David Colbeth, who's also a Mason here in Washington. Uh, last week we discussed the officer line. It was intended to be a discussion of the, the progressive line and moving up. And we ended up discussing a lot of the differences and a lot of how the officers work in the different areas. So uh, getting back to that, uh, thanks for coming, guys. David, you you had a couple of questions that you were interested in discussing. Well, we we kind of finished the show last week with talking about the officers that are elected in in Washington. Our elected officers are just the junior warden, senior warden, master, secretary, and treasurer. And in Canada, they include the Tyler in there. So I'm curious, Stephen, what did you have any idea about why the Tyler is elected in station? Um, no, um, and, and that could just be, uh, uh, a thing in our lodge being that our bylaws and everything are, are pre grand lodge. Maybe because it's an ancient custom, yeah. maybe because it's an ancient yeah. custom that could be. It, it, it could, it could very well be right. Um, I could, know. I could see that being an important role though. We, we talk about the idea of the Tyler, who it should be in that. And that was one of the, we talked again last week about the idea that we used to quote unquote, kick out the past master instead of having him become an immediate past master. And one of the excuses or theories was that this master has been out traveling. He's come through junior deacon, senior deacon, junior warden, senior warden, master. And he's, he knows all the guys in the district. He knows all the people. He, he's very familiar. He's maybe been on a grand lodge committee or something. And so he has some familiarity that's yeah, I got that right. <laughs> he knows a lot of people. <clears throat> and, and so you want to have someone as Tyler that can greet people and will know them and won't have to challenge them all the time. And that was one of the theories why we, they put the past master out there. But again, I think it's a waste of excellent knowledge, but so I could see how an election electing the Tyler, the lodge would say, who do we want to be our representative basically when our doors are closed or when well, we're reading it. And they're guarding, they're guarding that door, right? You know, uh, and, you know, I, I got to say, we have one of the best Tylers ever. He's been there forever. Um, and we know that we can trust him. Uh, one time, the Grand Master was in town and decided he was going to visit our lodge unannounced. And um, he came up the stairs without a dues card. And um, he... Uh, uh, my, oh. our, our, our Tyler, Robert, he's like, do you have a deuce card, sir? And uh, the, the guy's carrying this big ass apron case, you know, for the, the Grand Master's um, apron and all the, all the garb, right? And um, he's like, sorry, no deuce, no deuce card. You're not getting in my lodge. You know, I, I don't know you from Adam. I'm your Grand Master. Yeah, well, I've never seen you before, so you know, <laughs> uh, he 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 was not letting this guy in uh, for the life of him, right? Um, until he took the time and he proved himself worthy, right? <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of awesome. Up without a dues card, so yeah, good old good old Robert Stewart, he he's well known for that. I love it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I so which brings me to another side topic that isn't on is again not on point but i've been to lodges where they have the the virtual tyler 
where there's not enough guys to man all the officer positions and there's no one actually out there. We call him, we call him Casper. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we also now have a uh, camera that, that monitors the, the store. I mean, we have uh, doors that come up the big stairwell, and we have at the top of that camera that looks down there that has a little um, display on the inside of the lodge room. So we can have uh, it tiled from within. Um, and they did that because the tiler could sit on the inside of the room and not miss out on the evening's events. Well, at the same time, he can keep an eye on the door um, and, you know, jump outside the door of the lodge if, he, if somebody came up, right? That's um, pretty cool. Yeah, I thought that was a neat way to um, let him be part of the lodge because, you know, being on the outside of the lodge room, you know, typically they miss the whole meeting. And so they don't get to see somebody prove up. They don't get to see, you know, degrees. They don't get any of it, right? And, um, you know, that, that, that's a lot of the important things, right? So uh, I thought it was a really good idea to, that they put that there. Yeah, we've, I mean, we have a, a thing around here, at least. I'm assuming it's the same by you, David, that the, uh, the master will have the junior deacon invite the tiler to secure the outer door and tile from without the inner door or something like that. So he can close one door essentially and sit outside the, the lodge room door with the door open to, to hear what's going on in lodge. So, yeah, as before we go on to that, you had, you were starting to talk about a virtual tiler. Is there something more you wanted to add with that? Oh, no. Well, just on a, on a personal note, it, it bugs me. So in the, in the ritual, it says that the person outside the door is a master Mason. And so if you say, well, we're going to have this guy pro Tem and he's only a fellow craft, people will freak out about that. But on the other hand, if you say there's no one out there, oh, that's okay. We'll just pretend there's somebody out there. <laughs> it, it just, that makes no sense to me. A vicious double standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, I was just actually wrote down uh, tile from within. And because I was going to ask Stephen and even you, Matt, how I had never really thought about it, but several years ago, I might've been deputy or master. I don't know when I was, but one of our grandmasters, uh, Sam Roberts, I think it was, he gave just a 30 second education piece about tiling from within or with, from the outer door or all those kind of things. And so in King Solomon, as just an example, we don't have an outer door to tile. We don't have a ante room immediately outside. We have a space, but not a room. So you can't secure a door and tile, but you know, it's customary or kind of customary <clears throat> that the master tells the junior deacon, yes, have the tiler tiler tile from within. So the guy comes in the room, he closes the door, but does he go to the altar and sign in? So because in this particular evening, the tiler did not go in sign in, but that's part of our process that as a new Mason comes in the door, especially at a tiled lodge, he's supposed to go and deliver his his uh, greetings to the master right mm -hmm. and so in theory the tiler should be doing that right if he tiled if he comes in the lodge room and especially if he closes the door behind him that should happen now some tilers will do this greeting back at their chair and you know so they don't have to walk to a different spot in the lodge to do it which is fine but he was explaining he said you know if you just had the tiler tile from the open door and didn't come in then he wouldn't have to do that greeting ceremony and mm -hmm. i thought that was kind of a little cute little 30 second explanation yeah, that, of that, that, i think i think that door. works well uh, if he doesn't come in open door yep right yeah that's the way i mean i've never and around this area i have not seen a lodge have the tyler come in and close the door usually he just sort of moves his chair into the open doorway and, and sits yeah. out there so okay presumably if someone came bum rushed the lodge room <laughs> he would be the the obstacle for them to yeah yeah on the way so, so how does it Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, so I was going to ask about your, so we talked about the progression. You have inner guard. Ours starts with a junior deacon, basically. And then it goes to senior deacon and then junior warden. So what's, what is your, well, yeah, we probably should stay on this topic. I was going to, I was going to shift gears a little bit and say, is, is, is there, what, what are the requirements? I want to get to that if we have time tonight, maybe your time today to talk about the requirements and expectations of a new guy coming in. Uh, do, are they assumed that you should go up the line? So, but your junior warden and senior warden, so what are their roles kind of in, uh, like our junior warden is often in, in charge of the food and refreshments, almost all the degrees. And his, his job is kind of refreshments because it's yeah, part of the ritual. Uh, 
Yeah, I, as junior warden for this year, I'm in charge of uh, any of the food at any of the functions and the furniture uh, of the, uh, or pardon me, no, that's the senior warden, uh, any of the food. So really I have two stewards to boss around uh, because they actually do all the food, uh, but that's what I'm in charge of, yeah, them. And so you just said something about furniture and senior warden. Is that, did you mean senior warden or senior deacon? Cause our deacons yeah. are kind of in charge of the, the setting up the lodge and the furniture and all that. So your you're senior oh. warden's in charge of that? No. Well, technically he's in charge. He's in charge of the deacons. Okay. Right. And the deacons assist the senior warden in, in um, dealing with the furniture of the lodge. Right. So, um, which is kind of fun when we do our outdoor meeting every June, uh, our senior deacon and junior deacon have to go to the to the dungeon of the building and uh, get out all of our outdoor meeting uh, furniture and uh, truck it out to uh, our outdoor meeting place. Right, so um, they are in charge of the furnishings of the lodge. Yes, uh, talking about outdoor, I've always wanted to do. We have a couple of different outdoor. Well, so there's two formal, I guess you would call them outdoor degrees in Washington, the outdoor fellow craft and outdoor master Mason. And then there's several, uh, what's the word I want to say, uh, fun degrees, uh, loggers degree and uh, railroad degree and pirate degree and all these different things. Loggers degrees outside. I know that. And they have access and everything. Uh, and the grandmaster to go, doesn't wear a tie or if he did, he doesn't go away with a tie. Uh, <laughs> but it, I always thought it'd be cool to do, a midnight degree in the dark, you know, uh, ne of, never heard of, never, never heard of another kind of degree being done. That's, well, just, uh, you know, do a degree, whatever, first, second or third, even third, preferably, but do an outdoor degree at midnight. There's actually yeah. district, uh, district eight, just in my North here does the, uh, they do an, uh, they call it the torchlight degree. They do a torchlight fellow craft degree at the, uh, at the Masonic park here. They don't, it's not at midnight. It's, you know, it's after sunset, but it's not at midnight. Oh, but, really? yeah, they, they line the outdoor lodge area with tiki torches and that sort of stuff and, and do a degree. Oh, that'd there. be cool. I'll have to look yeah, for that. Be. I didn't know they did that. Somebody was taking pictures of it a couple of years ago and it was right around the Charlottesville uh, incident uh, right after the, the president was inaugurated <laughs> there. Yeah. And so there was a, there was a bit of a worry that if somebody started posting pictures to Facebook of Basins marching around with torches that <laughs> it might <be> badly, <laughs> but uh, I think it yeah. worked out okay. Uh -huh. I, I can see how it'd be misconstrued. Mis uh, yeah. Um, anyways, back to, back to the progression. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> so it is, um, generally assumed that you will progress through the line. We have what they call, what we, re we affectionately refer to as the curse of the senior deacon, right? Our, uh, our, our senior deacon never follows through and goes into the junior warden's chair, right? Hence why I just got um, <laughs> uh, recycled back into the junior warden's chair um, because our senior deacon at that point was not prepared to commit and go all the way through the line. And so they bail at that point, right? Really they should know that before they go into uh, being a junior deacon that they're prepared to follow all the way through but quite often um, they have great intentions but then uh, by the time they're halfway through their year as a uh, senior deacon they either get moved away for work or they are too busy and can't do the job and don't commit and, and don't want to let the lodge down so they just as soon jump out of the line. But it's such an important role. There's so many lessons learned in the performance of that role that having somebody skip it and go from junior deacon to junior warden is not a good idea. Yeah. All right. It's happened in the past and they, there was, um, um, there's always a, a heavy discussion when it happens every year, right? Because it, it leaves us stuck for who, who can go into that chair, right? Um, or who can go into the junior warden's chair. Uh, 
and you know it's it's a consistent problem but um that's where that's where a guy can get comfortable to say i'm out right <laughs> uh so I guess it's assumed that you're going to progress all the way through, but it doesn't always happen. Now, back in the day, I was actually having this conversation with one of the um, older Lodge brothers from my Lodge that's, I think, five years longer than myself in membership. Uh, I'm 20, he's 25 years. He says, back when he first joined, there was so many guys in Lodge that there were reasons to have elections for each of the junior warden, senior warden, and worshipful master. And it, you did not automatically go from junior warden to senior warden and into the worshipful master's chair. You actually had to run in an election and, um, I guess, compete against another brother for that position. Right. So do you not have, do you not have to hold an election for someone to progress from junior warden to senior warden? We, we still hold the, the election for it, but more often than not, it's by acclamation, hmm. right? Uh, we're, we're required in our code to do it by secret <clears throat> ballot. So I, we just had, an, we had to replace our senior warden, so we just had an election for him. So I made the ballots, and it had one guy's name on it and then other. So if, somebody, <laughs> if you want to write someone else in, you could. But, the, uh, the, yeah, we have to hold a secret ballot election. Yeah, we are. We've got it so that our secretary can cast a ballot on on mass. Really? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only time that that's not uh, the case is when there's more than one person letting their name stand for a position. So it, it was actually uh, our bylaws were amended to allow that. So your bylaws could be, so your, your constitution doesn't have that in there. Um, no, well, no, I will. It must not. If you, if your bylaws are yeah. allowed to be different or yeah. control that, I, I, I don't, I guess now that I think about it, is that absolutely in our code, man? I guess it is technically the, balloting is in our code, but the secret ballot for officers is definitely in the code. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The process for it, the, the mechanism or the procedures is not, that's a, ancillary document in our lodge officer's handbook which is kind of interesting but <laughs> <laughs> it's not codified how you have to ballot but just that you have to right right um and, and yeah it was it was quite the interesting uh, thing to know because like when i went to cuba for example i went back to visit the same lodge i've visited before um you know, many guys will go back and they'll try and visit a different lodge, but uh, I wanted to go back and see the guys that I met the first time around. And so it was two years later and it was the same worshipful master. I'm like, what's going on here? How come same guy? Like, don't they change every year? Right. Well, they have an installation of officers every year, but they have the election of officers and nobody will run against this guy because he's just too damn good. He, he got all the memory work down. He just, he, he just does a fantastic job. Nobody, nobody wants to run against the guy because, um, you know, I guess big shoes to fill. And, and it's not just because, you know, the guy stood six foot five and, and was like big <laughs> shoes, right? You know, he, uh, yeah, big shoes to fill with that guy because uh, he, ran, he, he ran the meeting perfectly. And, and the cool part is, even though it was in Spanish, right? Um, I understood it because they followed the same ancient work that I do. So I could follow along and knew exactly what was going on at each, uh, uh, as he's going through the ritual work. Right. So That's that, that well. was kind of cool. Yeah. Right? But yeah, they, uh, I don't know. Somebody else was telling me, and I can't remember where it was, but that they also have, uh, so many members that it's an, it's an actual election and there's usually um, two or three people that are letting their names run for each of the senior officers chairs. Wow. Right. So that really means that just because you do your time as a junior warden, you're not necessarily going to the senior warden's chair. Right. But it also means 
because our, our rules to uh, let your name stand for worshipful master is that you must have held the chair of a warden before. So it could be a junior or senior warden's chair, right? You don't have to hold both chairs and, and go progress through to become a worshipful master. Uh, since you're talking about that, it's interesting. I hadn't realized in our code or constitutions that uh, it is, we, we talk about things that are are missing from our code as being the, the code is silent in those areas. As an example, the there doesn't appear to be code for a person to run for senior warden or grand senior warden or deputy grandmaster or grandmaster. The only thing in the code talks about running for junior grand warden, putting in your name for junior grand warden it is a pretty much silent on any yeah. other position. So it's assumed that you're not going to skip the line. You're going to go right just to junior warden. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know, so Stephen, how often, so given that it is assumed that the, so Deacon becomes Deacon becomes Warden becomes Warden. How, so let's say, how often is that interrupted? You said your senior Deacon frequently does not end up moving forward just out of, out of bad luck. If nothing else, does the, Annually. does your junior Warden pretty much a hundred percent of the time end up being master or does that get disrupted often or? Our junior Warden typically, um, our junior warden typically does go through and sit as master, right? But we only, um, we have a lot fewer members. And so we really hope that once they do go into the, the line, that they do progress through. Uh, um, but we're always caught every year with the curse of the senior deacon. So I don't know why we don't just plan it that way. <laughs> Yeah, we've. I've actually only seen it once since I've been a Mason that the there was a contested election for any of those positions, and it was actually just this year that there were two people running for senior warden in one of the lodges in my district, or for junior warden. Excuse me, for junior warden, and uh, it was actually kind of cool to see an election that mattered. It wasn't just you know circle yeah. the name the page kind of thing. It was a uh, there were two different options. And so, uh, did they let them campaign, or did they uh, no. get to have a? Uh, 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 you know, um, the opportunity to speak on on their behalf or anything? No, that's not how they did it. They just sort of said, "Hey, the, there's an election, and and the following two brothers have expressed an interest." And then they distributed the ballots. They didn't. They didn't really uh, offer anything like that. Both of the brothers were pretty well known to the the whole lodge. But um, so, which actually brings up another question I had. So. David, uh, maybe you can speak to this too. Does your lodge do a, like for Grand Lodge, you were just saying the junior warden has to uh, submit a statement of intent with his little sort of Masonic biography, if you will. Do you guys do that for your lodge, David, or, or is that just a, a Grand Lodge thing? No, if we get a name um, five minutes before the lodge starts, I think that's probably about as, as far out of a statement or a declaration of <laughs> uh, uh, that we get. But uh, yeah, I, I think in, in some areas, even though the lodge is, operations aren't codified a lot of times it follows the grand lodge process so yeah you run for junior warden or you can put your name in that kind of thing but no we don't have a it is assumed we try to have a guy fill the junior deacon's place and let him see what happens or steward really more preferably let them see what's happening and so they can pay attention and work with them to continue up the line but even as master when i was master i had a young man that i thought is a great man great mason uh a but I, he was doing it as a favor to me when I asked him to be my senior deacon, and I shouldn't have. I should have had asked a past master to fill in that role and put him as a junior deacon and let the line continue that way. And I asked him to be my senior deacon. He had been a Mason a few years and been around Masonry through uh, his connection in Joby's. His, his wife was a, was a pass on her queen and that kind of stuff. And so he knew Masonry. And so I kind of thought he'd be ready for senior deacon. And Unfortunately, we have, we have a lot of grumpy past masters and they caught, rubbed it in the wrong way and he said, I'm done. And it was, I look at it as being my fault completely and not his at all. And so, and unfortunately, even more so, he became kind of turned off on masonry. And so he's still a great man, still a good mason. He just doesn't, isn't involved. And again, I, I feel pretty bad about that even to this day, but the, it does require some conversation. And so we're trying to do that this year. We had a, our senior warden a couple of years ago 
skip, he had to move. And so, uh, and then we had a guy that couldn't continue. And so we had to reorganize. We had to have a, a series of past masters fill the chairs for a year. And uh, as masters fill the master station, we had a different master every month and that kind of stalled the line. And then we had a couple of past masters coming through the line. I'm senior deacon. We have a past masters, junior warden, and then two new guys. And then we have a guy, two, three new guys behind us. So we're, we're kind of filling up those spaces, but talking to a guy about what his duties are and his responsibilities are going to be is just as important and trying not to scare him, but also make sure he understands what is required or what will be expected. And then giving him the support, not just saying, here's what you have to do. See you later. Hope you're, <laughs> hope you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which a lot of that's in the lodge officer's handbook. That was one of the things when, when we, when we revised it, that it had, uh, we put a lot of that stuff in there, but uh, so going back, we, in our lodge, it was a, again, we had two lodges merged to, to form what is now Mill Creek Lodge. And in, in the lodge I was in, it was like you said, David, basically someone said, oh, uh, who are we going to vote for tonight kind of thing. And, and then we, we figured out who to put down. And usually it was the senior deacon became junior warden. But uh, the lodge we merged with, Genesis Lodge, they had a tradition of doing letters of intent. So in the, if the elections are going to be in November at the October meeting, you're supposed to submit your letter of intent if you want to be elected to any of the five elected positions. And then uh, the secretary reads off those letters of intent at the October or at the meeting before the, the election. And it's not to say that you can't elect somebody else, but those are the names that go on the ballot that you can, someone could just circle. I love that idea. I just wrote that down. I love that. That makes it even more formal. I mean, DMLA requires that too, if you want to have letter of intent for mm. running for office. So that's great. I, I, I like the idea. I think we deterrent, uh, from some of these guys putting themselves forward if they think they had to put a letter of intent. Oh man, I got to do something else to go through. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, mine every year is like two sentences, you know, uh, uh, I worship very worship brother Matthew Apple intend to run for the position of secretary of Mill Creek Lodge. Boom. I'm done. But uh, uh, okay. we've had guys who have, who have written <clears throat> just since I've been secretary for the last two years. We've had guys who've written like a full page, you know, this is what I plan to do, and this is how I I would like to see things run, and that sort of stuff. And yeah. it's that pretty was, interesting that's a, to see. That's a see great they, example because in in a, a great example, Dean Malay, we were had we had a, a young man running for junior counselor, and the the session before the term before he had written a nice long letter, beautifully done, and then he didn't get elected. But the next season, he just assumed he was going to be the only one, and so he wrote basically the two line sentence. But the other kid that stepped up wrote a whole page and so when they read the two letters of intent even though the one guy was probably more qualified the new guy the brand new guy that wrote the long letter was the one that got elected <laughs> yep yeah well uh, like in our grand lodge when they go to uh the junior grand warden um they they have like full page bios in the communication yeah. on on each of them when right? is your when is your letter of intent due for grand lodge do you know mm, couldn't tell you uh, you, I, I assume that only those who've ever had the desire to put their names <laughs> forward would know that, right? <laughs> yeah, which, yeah. Do you have to know when the Washington one is? <laughs> well, it's, it's not a uh, – what <laughs> to my defense, to my defense, <laughs> the only reason I actually know it is because on Labor Day weekend, it was uh, July, uh, August – 30th or 31st I was camping and uh, Grandmaster Jim Mendoza, past Grandmaster Jim Mendoza, who we've had on the show many times, who's been an amazing mentor to me. Uh, if he happens to see this thing or hear this, thank you, Jim Mendoza. Uh, he, he messaged me and said, Hey, are, aren't you putting your name in for the, it, we, we, the Washington Masonic Charities had a new role for trustee and it was going to be elected from the body and it was a brand new thing. And nobody had, nobody knew about it really. And so he said, aren't you going to put your name in for the trustees? I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to most worshipful. And so, <laughs> um, and so I, I, at camping, I pulled up my laptop and you know, put my hotspot up and created a resume and submitted it the day before September 1st. I'll have to say September 1st is our uh, submission date. And so I sent it to our grand, our secretary and he said, uh, you might want to have more than this. And so I had to modify it quick before. And then, so I got it submitted. So, so yeah, so, but I think that's a little bit far off. September 1st is almost a whole year, you know, nine months basically before the elections in June. And, you know, I guess you, I guess if you know, you know, you know, if you're going to run, you're going to run. But you know, if a guy changes his mind or something, he decides to do it in January, he can't do it. Mm -hmm. And, and now with electronic balloting, 
you will, I, I believe in my heart of hearts, you will never see, an, unless this, a single candidate were to step down and not run as junior grand warden, if there was no competing candidates, then you might see the other ballot become an opportunity where they can take names from the floor. But in, in any other case, if there's at least a single candidate, you will never see an other names from the floor ever happen. I don't think it'll ever happen which is kind of a disappointment to me because that was a little bit of the fun of Grand Lodge to potentially see a, a you know some guy out of the woodwork almost kind of come to the... It, it, well, they, they still, I don't know about you there, but here they still got to ask if there's any more from any more further really? nominations. Oh, yeah. No, no, we don't. Ours is, if you don't have your letter of intent in, that's it. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, there's a letter of intent. And then like, like David was saying, the if there were three people running, there would be, you know, brother A, brother B, brother C, and then other. Yeah. And so if other got 51% of the vote, then they would have to have nominations from the floor. But other than that, it would always be brothers A, B, or C. So I, so talking about automatic progression, I was going to, I know we don't have a lot of time tonight, but, and maybe this is a whole other show, but hopefully not that <laughs> when a, when a new Mason comes in, I don't think it should be an automatic expectation that he's going to go into the line. There, I think there could be opportunity for a guy to be an excellent master mason, maybe even become an education person and help with education or help with other things. But it shouldn't be an automatic assumption that he's going to be a junior deacon. No, it, it used to be um, quite the push that as soon as they became a master mason, that they would give them a push to go into being a steward. And that stopped. Well, we, we put a stop to that for a few reasons. Number one, there was guys saying, you know, every time I come to Lodge, you put me to work in the kitchen. That's not what I signed up for Lodge for. Uh, number two, um, when we talked about um, uh, masonry with them along the way in the six-step program and in their coaching and mentoring, uh, we tell them, take your time. You have a lifetime to progress through, and um, you don't want to rush it, right? Um, the worst thing you can do is start saying yes to everything in Lodge, and then all of a sudden, by the time you hit Junior Deacon, you're burnt out, and you're, you've taken on too many things. And um, then, you know, we get the curse of the Senior Deacon. So we really don't want you to do that, right? And, and we tell them all, take your time. But... <clears throat> There are some guys who just know that they want to go through and there's other guys that know that they don't want to go through. And hopefully your mentor, your mentorship or your uh, membership recruitment and uh, retention committee has identified the true purpose or the goals behind everybody as they've come through. And if they have, uh, they would know whether or not to be pushing them in that direction or not. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and hopefully they're not pushing uh, for the sake of pushing. Yeah, there are some places that lodges I've been to where it's there's this disappointing tendency to say, you know, oh he's not, you know, he's not going up the line, or oh he's never been a past master or whatever that he's, you know, somehow lesser. And I've got to say, at least three of the best masons I've ever known were had no desire to be master, and they, you know. They were great. All three of them were, I'm getting, getting a little misty eyed, honestly. All three of them were great guys who have since passed away, unfortunately. But, you know, one of them was like steward once when I, since I was in lodge and, you know, it just wasn't his thing. He didn't want to be an officer, but he was at every meeting. He helped, he would give you the shirt off his back and, and twice on Sunday. And yeah. he would, and just because they weren't ever mastered is not somehow, which gets me on my whole topic of why do we maintain our, uh, titles after we get out of office, but that's a whole separate issue. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my tirade aside, uh, David, did you have anything else you wanted to wrap up with before we finish this episode here? No, I think we've, I think we covered all of it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, with you, with what you were just saying there, um, the guys that, uh, have given themselves so selflessly to, uh, the lodge and, have dedicated themselves, taken on different uh, committees or uh, like the guy in charge of our mentorship committee. Um, and he's also our chaplain. He uh, has no desire to go through the chairs and, and do all that memory work. Um, and now that he's had a stroke, he really can't go and do more of the memory work, right? So 
he gives other ways in lodge and that's we need those guys too and uh, for guys like that, we give the Masonic Medal of Merit. And um, uh, that really, uh, I think, um, means a lot more to some of those guys than, than uh, Past Masters Jewel does. Yep. Yeah. Well, yep. and Stephen, when you're sending me that list of ceremonies, send me the list of committees as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> well, and then. on that note, <laughs> thank you for joining us here on the Working Tools Masonic Podcast. Hopefully we will be uh, in your feed again soon with another uh, pertinent episode to what's going on in masonry today. On behalf of uh, Stephen Chung and David Goldbeth, and I'm Matt Apple. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.